Here we have FRQ5. So if you've been following along, uh, there's a link to all of these questions in the description. It links you right to a Google link, a uh, Google document. Uh, so you'll see all these FRQs. If you scroll down, eventually come to number five, that's this question. So if you'd like to try and solve it now, go ahead and do so. If you're having trouble locating this video, you want to go to the website youtube.com. Uh, and it's not YouTube, it's Y-O-U-T-U-B-E. So if you're having trouble, maybe try Googling YouTube. Uh, and that'll help you find where I posted this video solution. Okay. So this is a this is a kinetics question. Okay, and I'm going to try and go through a series of kinetics questions. Um, this one will be one. I think there's one up by eight, nine, or ten, um, and some equilibrium in between. I want to go through a bunch. I want to go through how to do the tables, how to do rate laws, what the rate law is, and I'm going to try and add in a little extra detail and a couple suggestions of things. Okay. So if you're going through kinetics right now, this is a great question. Um, and of course, we're going to tie in other topics to it. This one ties in a little thermal at the beginning. Okay, so this is our reaction. It's uh, A2 plus 2X2 makes two AX2s, all gases, and then energy is released. Okay, so the first question says, comment on the strength of the bonds of the reactants compared to the bonds of the, of the products. And what that's getting at is that's saying that there's different bond strengths in the different chemicals, and, and if you add up all the energy gained by bonding from one side, it'll be different than the other. A really simple way to look at this is you guys already had green to you reaction energy diagrams. We have your reaction and how much energy is in the chemical. We never say in the chemical, but we should. Okay? This is an exothermic reaction. We know we're getting energy out. You guys are used to drawing this like this. The change from here to here is how much energy it takes to break the bonds of the reactants. The change from here to here, on the other hand, is how much energy is released from the, from the making of the product bonds. So what we can assume from this, or what we can see really clearly, is that the drop to go towards the products is, is bigger than the increase to go from the reactants to the, activation, to the, to the activated complex. Okay. So the, the bond strength of the products is going to be larger. Okay. And if you want to think of that, you know, nicely is, this, the way I think about it is I think about a large magnet flying towards something. Okay? So, when I have this really large magnet and I let it go by the board, it flies towards it. It's accelerated towards it, but you'll notice that once I'm done, it's not moving anymore. So, in between it flying towards it and it stopping, there's been a transfer of energy to all kinds of other things. This board is now warmer, the air around here is now warmer. Okay? There's an energy present now it's not there. Okay, it's in a lower energy state. So bonds are very similar to that. If you think about these products, these AX2s coming together, it's like this magnet flying towards the board. The A's and the X's are coming together, and they're flying towards each other. When they stick, they now are going to go off in some direction at a much larger speed that can then be transferred to air or could stay with the molecule itself. But the long story short is that you've produced more energy. The reason why you're getting that energy is because of the very large stability of those bonds. Okay? So, a little thermo tie-in. Then it says, what's the sign of the enthalpy change? That's really clear from the reaction. So for this, delta H would be negative. It's releasing energy, so the chemical process ends up with less energy than it started. Therefore, delta H for the chemical process is negative. And then what is the entropy sign? For that, we want to look at gas molecules. I start with one, two, so I start with three, and I end with two. So entropy is going to go down because I'm decreasing the number of gas molecules. Okay, and then part three goes into when will this be spontaneous? Anytime you're talking spontaneity, write out this equation. And really, you can go through and just plug in the signs. Delta H is negative. And think about that. Is that going to make delta G be more negative or more positive? It's going to make it be more negative, which is going to be spontaneous. Delta S is negative, though. And since you're subtracting that, that's going to make delta G be more positive, which is going to make it not spontaneous. So we kind of have a battle of these two. If delta H is bigger, then it'll be spontaneous. This T delta S quantity is bigger, then it will not. So we want our temperature to be low in order to be spontaneous and have delta G be negative. So at low temperatures, this reaction will happen. At higher temperatures, it won't. Okay? So now we're going to get into the thermo part. The first question says, if they start tracking this reaction, they want to see how fast it is, and they watch one of the chemicals. Okay? So it says they watch the A2 and see how quickly it disappears. Let's say there's a color associated. There's some quantity we can measure really easily. 
if they track this, and then they could track the X2 in a different experiment, how would they compare? Would one disappear faster than the other? And even though this is kinetics, this is all the way back to, to strict geometry. For every A2 that reacts, you need two X2s to react. So the X2 is going to disappear twice as fast. Okay? And the reason is just as simple as two of them react for every one of the A2s. So which chemical we watch will determine a little bit of what our rate's going to be in a sense of twice as much. If we watched the AX2 appear instead of the A2 disappear, same thing, it would appear twice as fast. Okay, so if this is going down by one molarity per second, this is going down by two molarities per second, this is going up by two molarity per second. Okay. All right, so then with all of that, we can get into an experiment. So on the next board, I've got the chart that's from the FRQ. Okay. And, and it's small, so if you can't see it, just check it out on the link. I didn't want to have it take up the whole board. I want to go through and show you what you do with these, okay? Now, some of these are really simple. Like, I'll give you an example. If you look at experiments one and three here, okay, this sets you up really nicely. The amount of A2 does not change. The amount of X2 doubles and your rate doubles, okay? So what that implies then is that X2 is going to be first order. And we can tell by looking at that. And most kids, after a little practice, can tell. But I'm going to show you, if you have no idea what you're doing, the whole thing, why that works, what you're doing when you say that simple process. So if you don't understand, this is the whole reason why. Okay, so it turns out that their rate is always proportional to a constant times the different concentrations of the two chemicals. And for reasons that we'll go through later, the, the effect of each concentration will not always vary linearly. This can be to the first power, the second power, zero power. So, so it can have no effect on the reaction rate, or it can have lots of effect. I could double something and the rate could go up by four. Usually the exponents for these are zero, one, or two. Uh, lately they have been throwing up, I've seen a half recently on the AP exam, um, to try and throw off people who didn't understand the whole process. But here's what I can do. I can plug in this whole equation using everything for one experiment. Then I can redo the whole equation using a different experiment and divide the two. And when I do that, I'm going to set up a way to mathematically solve what x and what y are. Okay? So let's do that. Let's do experiments one and two. Okay? So experiment two, uh, well, it doesn't matter. Let's put experiment one on top. So for experiment one, my rate is 0 0.042. Okay, that's molarity per second. A k I don't know. Okay? And then A2, the concentration is 0 0.01, and that's going to be raised to the x power. And then my x2 concentration is 0 0.02. I'm going to raise that to the y power. Okay, so that's experiment one plugged in into this expression for everything that I know, and there are things that I don't. Then I'm going to do the same thing with experiment two. It's 0 0.042 again, same units. Still don't know the constant, but I do know it's the same. This is now 0.02. And this is now 0.01. Okay. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide. I'm going to divide this by this and divide this by this. And since they're equal, that's going to give me two quotients that should be equal. Okay. 0.042 molarity per second divided by 0.042 molarity per second comes out to 1. K divided by K comes out to 1. It cancels. So what I'm left with is 0.01 over 0.02, which is a half, raised to the x power. And then 0.02 divided by 0.01 is 2 raised to the y power. Now, even if you're not great at math, this should be something you recognize, that 1 half times 2 is 1. Therefore, x needs to equal y. Let's write that down. Which means that whatever the exponent of one of these is, the other one's the same exponent. Now, I don't know either one yet, but that's going to be big, because in this experiment, x2 is never held constant. So it's really difficult to figure out what a2's uh, rate is going to be, what its, what its order is going to be, 0, 1, or 2. All right, I'm going to go back, I'm going to do the same thing, but this time I'm going to do experiments 3 and 1. Okay, let's switch over to green and blue for this one. So I'm going to do experiment 3 versus experiment 1. So for experiment 3, I have 0 0.084 for the rate, and that's equal to the constant times 0.01 to the x 
times 0.04 to the y. Okay? And then for experiment 1, I have 0.042 equals k times 0.01 to the x times 0.02 to the y. Okay? So again, I'm going to have to do some canceling. 0.084 over 0.042 simplifies down to 2. K over K is canceled. 0.01x, 0.01 to the X divided by 0.01 to the X will also cancel. So even though I don't know what X is, because it's the same thing raised to X power, that's going to become 1. What I'm left with is 2 to the Y power equals 2. So what, what gives me that? Well, Y must be 1. Okay. So now, I know that the exponent that goes here is 1. If I go back, I previously found that x equals y, therefore x must be 1. So my rate law, which I'll put here in blue, is rate equals k times a2 to the first power times x2 concentration to the first power. Now that's a lot of work, but all I did with that is I found what the two exponents are. And that's the end of that question. Okay. So that's it. That's what you're doing when you're finding those rate laws. You're figuring out what those exponents are. Now sometimes you can do that without having to go through and, and actually, you know, actually go through and, and do all the math on that. A lot of times people can figure out, oh, you doubled this and the rate doubled, therefore it's first order. Or you doubled this and the rate, you know, went up by four, therefore it's second order. But that's a mathematical way that will work. Okay. If you got a weird question, that would be how you would want to attack it. Okay. Then it says find the rate constant. So I'm going to recopy this. So rate equal to k times a2 to the first times x2 to the first. Okay. So finding the rate constant k is a very common question. And all you want to do for that, quite simply, is go through and, and you want to just plug in numbers. So I'm going to plug in from experiment one. 0.042. All right, now your rate. Your rate will always be molarity per some unit of time. In this case, it's per second. Sometimes it'll be minutes. Sometimes it'll be hour. The other thing is you can write that also as molarity seconds to the minus one. That's the same thing. Seconds to the minus one is one over seconds. That's equal to my constant that I'm looking for times A2, which is 0.01 molar to the first power times 0.02 molar for the X2. So I'm just going to do an algebra problem. Number-wise, I'm doing 0.042 divided by 0.01 divided by 0.02. Okay? So that comes out to be 210. Unit-wise, you have molarities per second divided by molarity divided by molarity. That comes out to molarity to the minus 1 seconds to the minus 1. Now, your units of K will always have a time unit to the minus 1. Always. No exceptions. The molarity part will change. If this were overall a first order reaction order, then this would just be seconds to the minus one. If it were second order like we have here, where we have two first order reactants, that's going to be molarity to the minus one. If it were third order, it would be molarity to the minus two. Fourth order, molarity to the minus three. Zero order would be uh, molarity per second, would just match the rate units. Okay? So that would be my k value. And then it says, go back and plug in some values and solve for what the new rate would be. Okay, so now we can go back. Um, so we have our k value, it's 210. Molarity to minus 1, seconds to the minus 1. And it says if you had 0.08 for the A2 and 0.07. Okay, no one gave me one sig fig on that, so let's. Let's go ahead and pretend there are two on everything, uh, just for giving a reasonable answer. So that came out to 1.176, I'm going to round that to 1.2, and it's rate, so it's molarity per second, or molarity seconds to the minus one. Okay. And then the last question says, explain why the reactions occur at a faster rate as the concentration changes. So lost in all this math is what actually is happening. When I increase the concentration of A, my rate goes up. When I increase the concentration of X2, my rate goes up. When I increase one and decrease one, the reaction, you know, stays constant or depends on how much you decrease it by. But they never ask the question, well, why? Why does that happen? So the last part, I think this is part four, it's really important when you're explaining reactions that something really simple comes up, and that's collisions. 
when you have these A2s and X2s reacting, in order to react, they have to touch each other. They have to come into contact. So you want to explain these things in terms of that. The larger the concentration is, even per gas, the more collisions you'll have between the reactants. And that'll lead to more reactions happening. Okay? So you just want to identify collisions as being the primary function there, and then say that that's going to, more collisions will lead to a faster reaction rate because it'll lead to more reactions. Okay. All right, that's FRQ number five. Uh, there are plenty more if you go ahead and check the links in the description.